Welcome to this week's SV Links video. So we're working hard to finish up both of the hulls so that we can flip them over and get to working on the bulkheads in December. Yeah, it is our goal to get those bulkheads across and those hulls in position uh, by the end of December. It's gonna be tough because we only have you know five weeks left, but we think we can do it. And so uh, we're gonna work really hard at the fairing and sanding of the hulls, both of them, because um, the port hull is at you know 95% right now. We're gonna get it to 100. And uh, we've only got the first, uh, well, maybe two layers or so of a compound on the other one. So we've got some work to go on that one. So we're gonna be working hard at that. So let's get over the lot. We'll show you how that goes, but we don't wanna bore you completely with just sanding and fairing. So we're gonna take a bunch of viewer questions after we show you what's happening at the lot. So stick around for that. sanding all oh, yesterday and well actually Saturday uh, but then all oh, this morning so we finished sanding the entire hull both sides we blew it all off with our compressor and we wiped it all down with alcohol so nothing's coming off so this is our next round of epoxy that we're gonna put on and this is gonna be a much thinner round because Frankly, this is very curved and nice. There are a few spots where it needs a little work, but pretty round now. We're just trying to fill in and get it a smooth layer next, so we're gonna do that. All right, we're all masked up. So Brian's gonna be mixing here and uh, some stirring. I'll do some stirring and applying to the hull. He'll do some applying to the hull and I'll be spreading it out. Whatever works the fastest. So, like right now, I'm gonna take over this one so that he can start mixing another one while I stir. So this first thing we're putting in here with the epoxy is microspheres or micro balloons. They're the same thing. They changed the name. All right, so then uh, after that's the majority of it, but we do put in a little bit of silica, but not much. Because if we just went with the micro balloons at 10%, which is what they're supposed to be. This is way too runny to uh, be bearing compound. So we do have to thicken it up with a little bit of silica, but much less than the micro balloons. I'm gonna speed this mixing up a little bit and save our arm. We've got a little drill hook hooked up here. But we still give it a stir with a stick because we gotta scrape all the sides and that really doesn't do a good job of that on the bottom, of course. Now, I'm doing these big sides with the big trowel, but this is a very weird curving shape right here. So to get this uh, done, I'm gonna have to go with a small trowel, but just right here. Cause I got a bit of work to do on this up here. And I'm building out the front because this needs to extend out another Oh, two centimeters or maybe a little less than an inch. And so what I'm just trying to do here is I'm not trying to make it look nice. I'm just trying to make sure there's enough material out here that I can work this with the sander and get it nice. But I need material to work with out here. 
because this is supposed to be built out. So that's pretty good for what I need. Just built out a bit. We can extend that out to a little bit narrower point than the, than the basalt does. Because you can only curve the basalt around so much of a curve, so that's why on that. Now, I'm going to try and get the front of this better, but it's not going to be perfect. Because again, this is a oddly curving part here. And so, in this particular one, I would rather sand down to what I like. And if I just need to have the material here, like that. We're going to sand that down to the levels that we want on there. So, now this part here is already done, and so that's a nice and smooth. And then we'll just sand this back to this one right here. Uh, like I say, it's really odd. So now, I'm going to get to the big stuff again. So I won't need this little one anymore. All right, so slight camera adjustment. Get back to the big trowel here. So we'd marked a spot right here that was a little low with a circle, which is what I'm kind of going over right now. More. off for a minute so I can talk since I've already finished mixing all the way down we're down the last five feet of this side of the hull we'll do this and then we'll go to lunch so get some material out here short on epoxy here. The good news is Brian will be coming with one. We'll add some more in here. So, gotta wait. Wait for him to mix some. I'll come back. So we got the stern down here and I'm just finishing this off right now. I'm going uh, Quite a bit of excess here since I have to make up for that first two rounds that this one didn't get, so I'm putting it on pretty thick, but I'm taking it off where we have to tab around these surfaces. So uh, we 
looks odd, but it'll save us some grinding down the line. All right, like I say, I'm laying this on a bit thick, but that's okay, we'll sand it back and I don't have to bake up because this is the third round and this is only, never had a round on it, so I'm, I'm making it up in one shot. All right, so that's good. Remember that this all gets cut away for the kick up rudder, so don't care about that. We'll start on the back here and get uh, that going. I have a little excess here, so might as well use it. I'm gonna put a layer on here while we go to lunch and then I'll actually have a layer on here to make this a little easier. So that'll put it about the same height as this one. So when I go to put that layer on, it'll go on a little easier. I still got a little extra, so I might as well fill in this as well. Okay, should do it. Well, we've got uh, this done after lunch all the way to the back here again. Didn't make you sit through all that since we showed you the other side, but we're wrapping up. All right, all set. Time for the final repairs on the, this job. We sanded it all, it's all really pretty good. Uh, there's about one, two, three, four, five on this side and four on the other specific spots that we're gonna do right now. So nine total, but the rest of this hole is uh, good enough for what we want. And if you want to see what I mean by that, the sun's in a good position right here. So you can see that all along here from the shadows, it looks really good, but you can see one spot right there where uh, that's a problem. So that's the one of the nine spots we're gonna fix. But from general, uh, this hole is ready for paint. So we're just going to patch these nine little spots. We're not doing the whole thing. We're just going to patch these little spots because they're just a little tiny depression. And uh, give this that one more sand on just these spots. We don't have to sand the whole thing. And uh, it's done. So we're going to be ready to put our... Sorry, my camera's pointing the wrong way. We're going to be ready to put our barrier coat paint on this very soon. Uh, we'll let this set up for plenty of time because we have a big rainstorm coming in starting tomorrow and going for four days uh, here. So once we get this, uh, this patched up this afternoon, after we've let it set up uh, pretty good, um, this afternoon we're going to cover everything and it's not that much to cover. We just have to cover the two holes and a couple tables. So everything else goes inside the container. So really not very hard uh, to get prepared for this particular rain. And uh, then next week, we'll get some work done on this, maybe finish this up. But next week is a big holiday of Thanksgiving. And so uh, we're going to lose a few days there as well. For the next, so the next two weeks, we're gonna lose, uh, from between rain and, and the holiday, we're gonna lose quite a few days. So um, I'm going in for an operation on my hand uh, Friday. Um, I've got a what's called a trigger finger problem with one of my fingers and that's a very minor operation, but it does take between a week and two weeks to recover from that, get my full use of my hand back. And so by getting it done this week, uh, I don't lose as many days since we're already gonna be losing days for Thanksgiving and such. And for that other sort of eight days that we might be able to work, 
I'm going to have uh, some of the other crew come in and help Brian. I'll be here to supervise, but uh, I won't be able to do much with my hand bandaged up. So uh, we put out the call to our friends and family to come out and help. And uh, that means that we won't lose time because we'll have guest workers instead of me. And uh, that's good. So Brian's mixing up epoxy right now. We've already cleaned these spots and we're gonna put it on. So these repairs are very small so I don't really need to use a big trowel here. All we're gonna do is fill in just like that and make sure that it's feathered out all the way around. That way we know we, we got it just right. Very little sanding needed. So just cleaning up a little bit, but this is basically done. I leave a lot of excess right on these corners because it's really hard to get it perfect with a trowel. And I'd prefer to have excess and I'll just sand it off and uh, make it nice. I'm just cleaning off some excess down here that we spilled over onto. That way, when it comes time to sand this, just a little less sanding because we're going to be tabbing over these corners. So. We'll definitely have to sand them, but just want to cut down on how much I have to sand. Huh. Time to take down all the tarps for the rain over the next four days. That's what we've been doing at the lot. Now we're going to take a look at some questions from viewers that we've received over the last couple of weeks. And the first one is, how much has been spent on tools so far? And the answer for that is $5,462.43. And there's quite a list of special tools we have. And we'll let Phil tell you about those. And also, I just wanted to go over why that number is so exactly <laughs> precise. Um, my wife, the Admiral here, uh, has been an accountant for 40 years. Yep. And uh, she's tracking everything on this project down to the penny, everything we spend everywhere. So when this question came up, I said to her, how much have we spent on tools? She looked at it and said, this much. So we know exactly what we spent. 
And what those tools are is there's a whole suite of uh, DeWalt power tools that we purchase. You can see that back in uh, this video. And it's from the very beginning. Uh, and those are all um, battery powered so that uh, we don't have to supply power to them. But there are some wired uh, tools that we bought as well, uh, some grinders and, and such. Uh, and we also had a few tools donated to us from some friends and, and, and family for this. But probably the single most expensive tools in the project were the uh, flexi sander tools. The power tool uh, sander that curves to the shape of the, of the curve like the hulls and such was the most expensive piece at nearly $900 for that one. And then all of the um, sand, the large sander we have, we call the torture board, and also the applicators for putting on the fairing compound, those are all flexi flexible and from Flexa sander. So those were probably the single most expensive grouping of tools. But there's, this number includes some other things as well, things like our respirators that we built and all those parts we needed to, to build those from, and our uh, vacuum system that we built to, you know, uh, cyclone suck things up. And again, uh, there's a video for that. Uh, and also the um, respirators up here, which again, I'll put the links up there for you. So those are all part of that tool uh, group. And um, we expected that to run a little bit less than it has. Uh, this is a little bit over budget, but um, I do believe in getting the right tools for the job and you know, one at the same time that we needed another router, we just went and got one. And uh, so there'll probably be more tool purchases uh, into the future. It's one of those numbers we always knew was hard to estimate because we didn't know exactly which tools we would need along the way. All right, so. And this, per uh, w this person also asked, oh, yeah. will the final coating be epoxy coat or gel coat? Right, unrelated to the tool part. Uh, so. We had to think that through a lot because there are advantages to both of those things, both the gel coat and uh, going with epoxy paint. And they're different. And what we, the reason we decided to go with epoxy paint is for a couple reasons. One, it's much easier to apply gel coat if you're using a mold to create, say, the holes and such because you can spray that gel coat right into the mold, then you can spray on fiberglass after that, and when you pull it out of the mold, you already have a perfect surface uh, on that uh, gel coat. If you're spraying it afterwards, now it involves a lot of sanding to get that polished surface. And so uh, that's a lot more difficult to do if you're doing the kind of construction that we are uh, versus doing mold construction. And this, there's other reasons as well though. It's hard to match the color of gel coat later. So if you get damage to your gel coat and you have to repair it, no matter what it is, even white, changes the shade of white. Everything in gel coat changes color over time and it's incredibly hard to match that color. And the pros can do it, <laughs> we're not pros. And so that would be very difficult for us to fix out about in the world. Where paint is different in the sense that uh, the color stays the same and if you need to do a, a spray a new fix because you scratched it or something, it's gonna match the color really easily. Um, so as long as you're not using a custom uh, color. And we won't. So for those reasons, we kind of decided that it was easier for us to go with paint. And while we're talking about that, I just want to mention one more thing. When you do go with paint, you have two methods of applying it. You can either spray it on or you can roll it on. And spraying is usually going to get you a smoother, nicer surface than rolling where you can still have some um, marks from the rolling uh, uh, fiber on there or, or if it's um, uh, foam or whichever kind of roller you're using, you can get some pattern to it from that. But there are paints out there now that flow after you put them down and they come out to a nice glossy surface that is pretty much the equivalent of spraying. And for us, it's just a lot easier to roll because we don't have to enclose everything up. Uh, we don't have to worry about the overspray getting onto other things and taping all that off. It's just easier. And for a do-it-yourself build like ours, we just think it's gonna be an easier way to go to roll it. So we're gonna roll our epoxy paint on. So a little extra answer on, <laughs> on that one. Our next comment is that the yellowing could be UV damage. Uh, this person has it often where they are in Australia and they're not sure if it's affecting the epoxy and it would be interesting what's happening if you apply paint over the yellowed surface. 
And right. for that, um, it's yellow because our hardener is yellow, so that's the way it comes out when we mix it. Right, it's not actually UV damaged. Now, he's absolutely right. If you leave epoxy out in the sun, it will tend to yellow from that. Now, I also know, uh, because uh, we were looking at a boat a long time ago that was built in 1993. They got it all the way to the point where it was the entire shell done with epoxy finished on it, but no paint. And then it sat there in the California sun for 10 years and it turned yellowish on that. We were going to buy that boat for, for a lot of different reasons. We didn't end up buying it. Uh, it just wasn't the right time for us. And so another group came along and purchased that boat and they painted it right over that yellowed epoxy. It worked fine. They've been out sailing that thing now for the last, I don't know, 12 years. And it's been perfect, not a bit of problem with that. So just because it's yellow doesn't mean you can't paint it. But again, as the Admiral just noted, uh, we use Sikkiman and it has yellow uh, hardener. And when you mix it, it comes out with a yellow tinge to it. So when we apply that epoxy, it already looks yellow. But some of this stuff is, is less than you know, 24 hours old and it's already, of course, looks yellow. So it's not UV damage in our case. Our next question is uh, regarding all the people that have helped us so far. Uh, are they coming with you on your journey? And everyone, uh, family, friends, other helpers that we've had, they're all very welcome to come on our journey with us at different points but we know that uh, people are interested in different things and they have busy lives, so they're not always going to be available to come with us, but when they can, they are very welcome to join us. That's why we built the style of layout in the boat that we built. We went with a four cabin version instead of a, an owner's suite, which most people do for uh, the main couple who owns the boat. And I understand why, they have more room in the hull for them with a the bigger uh, head and a little more storage and, and such. But we chose to go with four cabins because we want the room for all those friends and family and anyone who's helped work on the boat, earns that golden ticket, <laughs> uh, to come uh, on the journey with us. So we don't want to do this alone. And so we're hoping to have a minimum of four people on board and some words up to eight and 10 people at, at a few times. So uh, they're all welcome as much as they can make it. Our next comment is um, someone who is asking about our plans for the interior timber work. Is that going to be do-it-yourself or are you planning on recruiting a professional? Well, <laughs> there's, a, there's a good answer for this. And that answer is there really isn't any major woodworking on the inside of the boat. And that's simply because the entire interior of the boat, every cupboard, every locker, every chair, well chair, but uh, seating area, uh, counters, uh, bathrooms, every single bit of this boat is already included in the kit. And so it's one of the things that makes these Shoning boats so strong because there are no separate modules for let's say the head or you know uh, a cabin or something that are lowered into the boat and then attached with putty to the hull, which is exactly how a lot of production catamaran builders do it. Now some are better than others and some of them use epoxy and don't use putty but it's common practice to just lower these in and then sort of glue them or putty them to this to the hull. On a shoning boat everything is epoxied together. It becomes one integrated structure of the whole boat and their boats become incredibly strong and incredibly stiff and thankfully very squeak free because there aren't two separate pieces moving, everything is epoxied, which means glued together. So uh, we won't have to have a lot of woodworking done. Now, will there be wood surfaces? Yeah, there will be for looks, but really underneath of them, those are all foam and epoxy uh, pieces that were already included in the kit. And we may just cover them with some wood veneer just for looks, but it's either paint or wood veneer everywhere. But the structure of the whole thing it's already built. So we'll just do all the painting and any veneering work that needs to go. We don't need any, uh, any pros for that. Our next comment is that most epoxy is not UV stable, especially in the hot California sun. Unless you have a unique epoxy, 
you may consider covering everything until it has been painted. And we have a new plan for that. Yeah, we always did plan to have it covered. And we built a big cover. That was a mistake. Uh, and we've made more than one mistake and we will make future mistakes as well. It's just the nature of, of building the first boat we've ever built. Uh, we knew that going in. We're not worried about mistakes. As they come along, we just solve the next issue. In this case, we built a shade cover that uh, wasn't done very well. And when it rained, it caused pools and those pools were heavy and that collapsed it. And if you want to see about that, here's a video uh, that shows you that whole fiasco. But what we did at the, at the moment that that happened is we needed to keep working and we didn't need a really tall shade structure at that time. So we just took the tarps that had been part of that so we didn't have to buy more and just put a low cover over the tops of the canoes. But we always knew that wasn't going to work for the boat once we start flipping those canoes over, putting the bulkheads across and taking that thing up because it's going to get really tall. And it's going to be about 15 feet off the ground uh, when we do that. And whatever cover we have over it can't be 15 feet high. That leaves no room for us to walk underneath and work. So it has to be more like 20 or 21 or two or three feet tall, very high it's for us to be able to work on the boat. And so we didn't have a solve for that. Now we did have a, some viewer comments uh, just a few weeks ago. I didn't have them in this, but I'll go over them anyway. And they were saying, you have to get a, a, a tunnel tent to do this. And at the time, I wasn't sure we were gonna do that because they're very expensive. And we're running close to our budget and we're hell bent on not going over our budget or going over it by very little. And so, you know, when we start looking at something extremely expensive that goes beyond our budget, we have to really consider whether that's something of value to us. So we're getting close to flipping those holes. I mean, we're only weeks away from putting the bulkheads across, and that means we can no longer have that low shade cover. And so we finally talked it through, looked at the budget together, and we made the decision after doing some research on costs and stuff to go ahead and spend the $4,500 to put a tunnel tent over. And these, these are, are designed to go from a shipping container to a shipping container. Well, we have a shipping container on one side, which is great because we'll attach it along that one just like it's supposed to be, but we'll have to build supports for the other side since we can't fit a shipping container on. Our lot is 38 feet wide and from the edge of the shipping container to the fence and it's uh, no room for another shipping container over there and the boat in between them. So uh, that's not going to work. But we can put a tunnel tent over and we have ordered it. It'll be here eight to 10 days from now. And so you'll be seeing us uh, putting that up. And the nice part about that is once it's up, that will give us protection from rain, from sun and from UV damage, all of it on the boat. And so after thinking about it, you know, $4,500 over budget, but uh, two years more we have, or maybe a little less, but hopefully no more than that uh, to go. And that's a lot of time with the sun beating down and the rain, particularly when this year is a El Nino year where they're expecting exceedingly higher amounts of rainfall in Southern California than normal. So that was another factor that we looked into this. He said, well, if we're gonna do it, we might as well do it right now. So, cause winter's coming. And we already had our first rain last week. So that's, that's the plan on that. Our next question is, would you tell us the fillers you use to make your fairing compound? And we have cotton flock, silica, and micro balloons or spheres. Right, and there's the, all three of these, by the way, are white. So you won't be able to tell what we're using in, with the epoxy by the color because it's all three are white, so it's always white. But depending on what we're doing, there are different mixes. Some things we do don't have any fillers in them. Some of them use just some cotton flock and silica. In those cases, what we're getting there is a very hard surface. So for example, when we did the rope and we rolled up the, uh, the rope in there, uh, that was rolled with no fillers in it whatsoever. But then when we fill on top of that rope to seal it off, that's a thickened epoxy. So that had some cotton flock and a certain percentage of silica in it because we really don't have to sand that much. We just grind it flat with the grinder, which you've seen in the videos. And so it's, it's not something we have to use sandpaper on and uh, sand that. But when it comes to fairing, that's a whole lot of sanding as you saw in this week's video and probably last week's video and 
several others. In fact, we're hoping, we're trying not to bore you with too much of, you know, of the sanding stuff, which is why we're answering some questions in this video. And, but the fact is, is that that has to be easier to sand. And fairing compound isn't about strength. It's really putting a surface on there for the paint and bottom paint to look good. And so we want to round that surface off, but it's not really so much about the strength. The strength is in all the uh, fiberglass and basalt that we have over the hull. And then this is just a uh, smoothing of that. And so it's okay if it's not quite as strong, so therefore we can use micro balloons or microspheres uh, in there in the compound. So it's about 10% to the weight of the epoxy in uh, micro balloons. And then there's also a little bit of cotton flock in there and we top it off with just a little bit of silica because the silica is what thickens it to just the right thickness. Because if we get it too thin, then as we trowel it on, it just falls off the trowel onto the ground. We get it too thick, then you get too much orange peel and such. So you've got to get just the right thickness and we use, we can't put more micro balloons on because it gets too weak. So 10% of that by weight and then just enough silica to make it the right consistency. So that's the answer to that question. Our next comment is, it's great fun to plan out a journey in such detail, but remember, sailing plans are etched in sand. And that is very true. What we are doing is a little bit of dreaming, and it's a great motivation for us to complete this project. So we're, we're planning what all the things we would love to do and see, and we'll get there eventually, maybe not in the same order, but, um, and we're going to be flexible on our, our plans when we get out there in the, in the world, but it's a great motivation for us to get through this hard work project. Absolutely. And just so you know, we have over 50 different versions of the routes we're showing you. And that's so that at the time that we are making a change because some politics have changed in some part of the world or the weather is different than we expected or just not cooperating or there's boat repairs and they're stuck somewhere because we're waiting for parts or any of those kinds of reasons and more that the route and timing of the route may change. Well, we have many versions that we could say, well, let's, Instead of going here next, maybe we'll take this one where we thought about possibly going up there, or maybe we'll just delay in time. We know that this has to be flexible, and if you try to sail to a schedule, that's disaster. So, uh, particularly when it comes to weather, you just can't fight Mother Nature, and we, we don't want to be out there when the weather's terrible. So we're going to always stay as long as we have to, and wherever we're at, to get a good weather window before we go. Our next uh, comment and question is um, someone who's wondering if we have um, con concerns about uh, construction issues such as delamination or structural cracking from inexperienced layup. But layup. Um, and he wants to know if that concerns us. Well, the answer is <clears throat> it doesn't concern me in the slightest. And the reason for that is why we chose to go with Schoening Designs as uh, the maker of our kit. That's not to say that there aren't other kit manufacturers who are great as well, not saying that. But we chose to go with Schoening Designs because of their 35 years of experience. Over 400 boats have been made from their uh, kits. And these boats are known for how strong they are. And they're all, most of them are do-it-yourselfers and they don't have issues with the boat cracking or delaminations or any of that stuff. And part of that is because of the materials they use. We aren't using any, any, anything other than epoxy as far as our various gluing surfaces. No vinyl ester or polyesters. We are straight epoxy on everything. This boat is incredibly strong. And of course that's expensive because it's the most expensive of those uh, glues. But it also makes this boat incredibly strong. And so we're not worried about uh, anything like that because history has shown us that we don't need to be worried. We just follow their instructions. That's all. <laughs> Absolutely. And he has a secondary question about uh, what is the epoxy rope in the bulkheads for? Well, that's simply that those are foam panels and they are flexible. They're not very flexible, but they do flex. And you can see that when we're carrying one, you'll see it wobble a little bit and such. So when we're building bulkheads, they need to have 
structural strength. And so by rolling up fiberglass and impregnating it with epoxy and inserting it around the edges of that, it stiffens those things up and adds strength as well. So uh, it just makes that foam panel much stronger. It's also why they have us laminate the outside a little bit more than what even comes laminated on the panel. So we put some extra lamination on some of those if they're high stress bulkheads. So that's generally what that rope is for. So that's it for our questions and comments for this week. Well, thank you so much for asking these good questions. We do appreciate it. Um, we've had some long discussions with a couple people about certain things. Uh, you know, um, we don't. We try our best not to take any any kind of a front and take all of your suggestions with um, an open mind. That uh, that might be something we need to look at. Now we're not going to follow all of them, but we do look at them. Yep. And but sometimes we have the reasons why we are doing things, and we've done that research already. And so we'll explain to you uh, why we don't want to do whatever that is you're suggesting. So that's where the long discussion comes up. But it's not. It's not something we're angry about. We're just trying to explain our choices. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up for this week's video. And we do appreciate all of you watching all of the fairing and sanding. There's a bug in my face. And um, next week, there's going to be more fairing and sanding. But uh, there's some other interesting stuff as well. Uh, next week is a holiday week for us. We're going to get to an American holiday called Thanksgiving, if you're not familiar with it. And uh, it means we eat until we pass out, basically. And uh, so that's going to be in the latter half of that week. So uh, we're only going to be working the first few days. But I'm also going to be out of commission for that because I'm having an operation on my hand. And so I'll get into that in the video. It's no big deal. But it's going to knock me out of work for, you know, eight, ten days. So we chose to have that operation when Thanksgiving was so that I don't miss as many days. But the few days that I do miss, we'll have guest fills. <laughs> well, we'll have uh, other crew in who will work and do what I'm saying. Uh, and I'll be there to supervise them, and they will no doubt be quite annoyed with that. But <laughs> um, they will take over the work for me, and we, we don't want to lose a day if we don't have to anywhere. And so we're going to have a lot of help next week. So that's pretty much it. Thank you to all our patrons, of course, and to you viewers. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and click on the bell icon to be notified of our next video. And we'll see you next Thanksgiving week. Bye. Bye.